yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap right. fed. Today we're talking about Olaf and Jackson, uh, which is sort of, as I said, the spoiler is going to be that some of the, the te- a lot of the techniques we're going to describe, the modern columnar databases aren't going to support this, but uh, and we'll mostly see the bitmap indexes will be mostly used in row store I- database systems that then want to have sort of accelerated col- columnar access. Um, but well, you know, let's go through a lot of the different things. So where we, off, where we left off, last class was we were discussing uh, the pros and cons of the sort of the columnar storage versus row-based storage. And I talked about how uh, most modern OLAP systems are going to be implementing some variant of PACs um, because that's going to be better for doing sequential access, sequential scans on, on a large amounts of data. And there'll be a bunch of optimizations that we can apply to, to make these run faster. The key thing to remember, too, is also all the attributes in a columnar database must be fixed length because the way we're going to do addressing is through offset arithmetic. Right, we're scanning one column. If we know we're at the, the 100th uh, offset within that column, we know how to do the simple math to jump to the 100th uh, offset of the other columns uh, to go put, stitch tuples back together. The other big thing there is that we're going to, uh, not always, but if we assume that, or the data system assumes that the data files are immutable, meaning they're write once, read many, like I write it once and I never can go back and make inline updates to it, this is going to open up a bunch of different optimizations that we'll see today where if we had support incremental updates or deletes or insertions, then some of these things simply just won't work or they'll be too expensive to maintain. So this is another big, big optimization or assumption that the, the modern systems are making. All right. So the first thing to sort of motivate what we're talking about today is when we talk about OLAP indexes, we have to sort of forget all the things we learned in introduction class about indexes, uh, like in, in particular for B plus trees. Or if you're familiar with like radix trees or tries, right, these, these tree-based data structures, or even hash tables. Because in, in the, the old TP world, which is what the intro class sort of focuses on without explicitly saying it, um, these indexes are designed for doing, finding individual tuples or small number of tuples with very selective uh, predicates. You can go get Andy's account or go get Andy's orders, right? And the, in the OLTP world also, well, uh, also as well, we're not going to assume that the files are immutable. And therefore, these index data structures, the B plus trees, are going to have to uh, store some extra, some, some extra room in their nodes to accommodate updates later on. Right? So in the leaf nodes, on average, the leaf nodes are actually any node in B plus tree in a real world database system on average is about 70% full. All right, so that extra 30% is wasted space because they want to be able to amortize the cost of someone inserting new, new data and not have to do a split uh, for every single operation. Right? So in the OLAP world, we, we don't need to support incremental updates, again, assuming that our files are read only. And we typically don't need to find individual tuples, at least at the, the lower points of the of the query plan, right? the access methods on, on the tables themselves. When we do joins, yeah, we're going to have to find individual tuples or values that match. But if you're just doing scans, it's, you know, you're not going to lo- look at Andy's record or a- Andy's orders. You're going to look at all the orders from some demographic, like some people, like everybody that lives in Pittsburgh. And so the, the data structures we would use to make OTP workloads run really fast are gonna, not going to be what we want to use for, for, for analytical queries. So the question is, what can we actually do to speed up sequential scans? I got to get a new clicker. All right. So here's a big list of optimizations of things you can do. Some of, the, some of these things we're going to cover this semester. Some of the things we won't. So the first thing you do is obviously data prefetching. Right? Instead of stalling every single time I got to go get new data, if I know I'm going to sequentially uh, scan a bunch of files or a bunch of pages that are contiguous, let me go ahead and while I'm scanning one, start bringing in the next one uh, off a of disk into memory. Then I can, you know, as I'm running my query, instead of having just one thread be responsible for scanning a terabyte of data, I can have multiple threads do this uh, and run, run the task in parallel. 
I'll get some advantages also too if I can pre-sort or cluster the data ahead of time because now I know that if I'm looking for things in a certain range that once I get past a, uh, you know, a certain set of values, I know that the thing I'm looking for is, is less than the, what the values I'm looking at right now. I know I need, don't need to look at anything else. Late materialization we talked about last class where, and we'll talk about more of this later in the semester, where if I have a column stored, instead of having to pass around the entire tuple from one upper to the next, you have to just pass around the offsets or just the columns of, of the, the, that, that I need at that point of the operator. So I'm, I'm, I'm copying, moving less data around. Materialized views, as, as, as I said, we're, 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 we're not going to be able to discuss in this class, uh, but it's, it's sort of a variation of result caching. Result caching is really simple. Like if I had the exact same query, like you know, select star from table foo where ID equals four, I can take that result and cache it. And if the exact same query shows up, I can reuse it. Materialized views are way more sophisticated because it's taking a more complex query, maybe breaking it down into uh, to smaller parts, uh, and then as I uh, make changes to the database, I can incrementally update the materialized view without having to re rerun the entire query, ideally. But it's, it's essentially, it's a result of, it's a, it's a variation of result caching. The idea is the same. Data skipping is being able to figure out what data we actually don't even need to read ahead of time. Uh, and just avoid having to do scans on that. Data parallelization is where we can uh, use vectorized instructions or like SIMD to be able to apply different operations or do different uh, steps in our uh, sequential scan in parallel on a uh, multiple pieces of data at the same time. And then code specialization or query compilation, compilation just-in-time compilation is to generate machine code that, is, that does exactly what our scan is going to do or, or what our query is going to do, instead of having to use a, an interpreted system. So there's a lot of things here. Uh, and this semester, we're going to cover the, these, these here, right? What is kit materialized views? We've already sort of discussed prefetching in the intro class and clustering and sorting. It'll come up throughout the semester, but I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to sort data. Like, that, there's a, we, we just use whatever the fastest one is at this time. So, Again, a bunch of these things we're going to cover throughout the semester, uh, but today's class we're going to focus on data skipping. You can think of like, again, all of these are things you could do to accelerate query execution, uh, and so, but we're still kind of focusing on the, the lower bowels of the system, like the storage layer. So that's why we're just going to focus on this for now. So at a high level, there's two things you can do to, to skip data. Um, you can do uh, a lossy approach or a lossless approach. So a lossy approach would be approximate queries. So the way to think about this is, say I'm doing an analytical query like select count star on the number of website visitors. Uh, in most systems that doesn't do, that don't do approximate queries, you would get an exact answer. We look at every single, you know, uh, every single web visit and just count all the entries. But in many cases, in many application domains, you don't actually need the exact answer, right? Do I really care that I need to know the exact number of visitor, visitors to my website? Uh, to the exact person, like you know, 999,000, whatever? Or can I get something that's close enough and that's enough for, for my application? So this technique, again, is called approximate queries. There are, uh, there are systems designed explicitly for doing nothing but approximate queries on top of it, like a, a non-approximate query database. There's a project out of the University of Michigan um, called VerdictDB, uh, with Barzan and Safari, he spun that off as a startup called Kibo. That basically sits in front of Snowflake and does approximate queries in front of Snowflake, even though Snowflake is not by its, you know, in its basic form an approximate query system. But a bunch of these other systems, BlinkDB was a project out of, um, uh, it was a research project out of Berkeley that sort of did the same thing. But these, all these other systems here, like Snowflake, BigQuery, they have approximate query uh, aggregates. So you can call, select, you know, there's count star, there's the count thing that gives you the exact answer. There's also like approximate count, right? And it's basically using sampling and a way to give you uh, some statistically bounded guarantee of the accuracy of the answer. So with approximate queries, you basically say, I'm only, I'm only gonna sample, I'm gonna read you know, a fraction of the data that I regularly have, right? The other approach to do a lossless pruning, or sorry, uh, data skipping is to data pruning where we're going to rely on some auxiliary data structure that's been uh, pre-built on our data or be maintained by the database system that's going to allow it to identify portions of the database, the portions of the data files for a table that's needed in a scan that it doesn't, doesn't need to read. 
right? Again, a B plus tree is basically this, right? B plus tree says, I can, if I'm looking up some, some, some value on a predicate and I have a index B plus tree on that predicate, I can get down to the leaf node, find the thing I'm looking for without having to scan the entire table. It's basically the same idea, but we're going to see a bunch of different ways that we, we can do this uh, in this class. And so one of the trade-offs we're going to have to consider as we go along, and you'll see this multiple times, is the scope of the, this auxiliary data structure, like what, what, what is the purview, how much data is it is actually covering in its, uh, in its the metadata is generated for this auxiliary data structure versus the, uh, how selective the kind of filter you could be. Right? Think of this like I have, if I have a, th always think in extremes of databases or in systems, is always going to think about the, the scope of the problem. Like on one extreme for the scope of, a, of, of one of these uh, printing data structures would be the entire table. So I have a billion rows and maybe I keep the min and max value for, for, for uh, you know, in a column in a billion rows. That's not going to help me skip any data because the min and max is basically the entire domain of the column. Or I could have an auxiliary data structure on every single tuple. But then that's useless too, right? That's the other extreme. So we want something in the middle where it's going to be large enough that we, it's going to allow us to throw a lot of, of data away, but um, uh, sorry, small enough that's going to allow us to throw a lot of data away, but not too large where, uh, I'm sorry, large enough that it's, we can throw a lot of data, but it's not too small. We're spending all the time looking in this auxiliary data structure, right? All right, so, and then the other issue is also, is it going to be manual automatic? For most of the approaches we'll see, where zone maps in particular, these are going to be automatic. The DSYSTEM just does it. For the bitmap indexes, these are things you have to define. Um, and you have to know, like, uh, in some cases, you have to define what the ranges are. All right, so this class, we're only focusing on this. We won't discuss approximate queries uh, for the rest of the semester. You know, there's, how to say this? This requires, again, outside knowledge of the data external information about whether the application is okay with approximate answers that the data system can't figure out for you. Like, it doesn't know whether you're okay with a, with a, a rounding error in your bank account. You're probably not, but it doesn't know that. You have to be told, I want to run approximate queries. So we can ignore that for now. All right, so the considerations we have to have for anything anytime we're doing data pruning uh, or using auxiliary data structures, of course, is going to be how selective we want or how selective these predicates are going to be. Like, if, if, if there's a uh, column that's a Boolean value, and it's every, every 1 billion tuples, this column is, is true, we don't want to build an index on that because it's useless, because we might as well just scan and rip through it. Um, so how selective the queries are going to depend on how, uh, how effective these, these, uh, these auxiliary data structures are going to be. We also have to consider the case of how skewed the data is. Again, my extreme example where everything is, is, is set to true on a, on a billion rows. If I build a B plus tree on that, or a bitmap index on that, it's, it's, it's useless. Because like, if I get, to, get the leaf in the, in the B plus tree, and then there's a giant linked list or giant list of all, all the other tuples. Right? So there's a trade-off here that we have to be consider. And then again, we, we won't discuss this too much, but if the data is already pre-sorted, uh, then that's going to allow us to do some optimizations that uh, we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So there's a lot of things we want to cover. Uh, and again, this is just like a quick. Uh, smorgasbord of everything you could possibly do. Uh, there's other things too. We're, we're going to ignore multi dimensional indexes and, and uh, full uh, inverted indexes um, just because I want to focus on the OLAP stuff. All right, so we're going to go through zone maps, again, the most common ones, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about different bitmap representations. Uh, and then that'll lead us into the imprints and, and the column sketches with the paper you guys read. Okay? All right, so. As I said before many times, zone maps are the most common uh, sort of data skipping technique that uh, most systems use, or a lot of systems use. And the basic idea is that these are just pre-computer aggregates for all the individual values in, or all the values in individual columns of a, of a table, right? And the idea is that for certain predicates, we could check the zone map first and see whether there could be any data in, in the block we're about to read or the, the chunk of data we're about to read based on the zone map. And if we know, according to the zone map, there isn't, then we just skip it entirely. Right? So say I have a simple column. It has uh, five tuples with, with this consuming a, sing, a simple table with a single column, and it has uh, five tuples. So the zone map for this, we could compute the min, the max, the average, the sum, and the count. All right? Pretty straightforward. But now my query comes along, select star from table where value is greater than 600. Uh, 
the first thing I would do is go look in, in the zone map and say, well, I know I'm looking for a value that's greater than 600, but the max is 400. So therefore, I know there isn't going to be a value in, 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 this, in this block of data that could match my predicate. So I can just skip it entirely. Right? Pretty straightforward. Um, and again, I showed this, uh, this diagram last, last class uh, from the a Databricks talk where they talk about Parquet. And lo and behold, without calling it a zone map, right here, they call page, page has metadata, with the min, max, and the count that's stored in the header of every chunk. Right? This is the zone map. I think Oracle invented the term zone map. Maybe it's copyrighted, I don't know, trademarked. Uh, but when people say the, the original def definition was called materialized, small materialized aggregates, that's the original paper uh, from some, this paper here from this, this German guy. Uh, but the, everyone pretty much calls them zone maps, even though Oracle had them, has them, or calls them that. Right? So again, pretty straightforward, not hard to compute. And because, uh, at least in the case of Parquet, these files are immutable, we don't, have to, we don't have to maintain this. We don't have to change this all the time. We just store it in the header, and we're done. All right. So the, uh, as I said before, there's a trade-off between the scope of the zone map and, and its efficacy. I can have a zone map on, in, on an individual tuple. That's going to be useless. I can have a zone map on the entire uh, table. Again, that's probably not, it's, that's not going to help me either because, uh, well, if I have a, well, actually it could help because if, if I know that the thing I'm looking for is not in the bounds of the zone map of the entire table, then yeah, I avoid reading the entire table. Uh, but if, if, you know, in the likely case that it is in there, then, I'm, then the zone map is basically useless and I spent time you know, you know, processing and reading it. The other point to point out too with zone maps is that they're only useful when the, the attributes position and the values are correlated, meaning if, if the thing I'm looking for, uh, if, if, you know, on a certain column, is, and that column's values are, are completely random, then the zone map's gonna help, not gonna really gonna help me again because the, the value domain that's encompassed by the block of data I'm looking at uh, could be quite large, and therefore, every time I check the zone map, it's gonna come back as true for my predicate, but then, I'm, I, you know, then I gotta go scan it and find the thing I'm looking for anyway, right? But if I could pre-sort the data on the, pred on, the, on the attributes that are in my predicate, then I'll, my zone map will be able to start to help me throw, throw things away. So again, zone maps are, is it an index? Sh sort of, right? Like it's, it's not, a, well, it's a filter, not an index. So a filter would tell you, is something here, yes or no? And I'd have to go look for it. Index would tell you where it is. So this, this is a filter, but it's still, again, this is the most commonly used one. And it's not just like you, you have to have additional code in your query execution engine to be able to uh, you know, consider these zone maps as part of the, 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 the process of deciding what data you actually want to read. Um, I have uh, off the record numbers from, I'll have to, I'll have to bleep this out. Um, they said like, I think like it's 80 to 90% of the queries get a, take advantage of zone maps. Uh, and, so that, and, and again, at their scale, that's massive. So, right, yeah, so, so the, the win for these is quite obvious. This is why everyone does it. But again, like it's, although 90% of the queries of, of, you know, they're talking about we take advantage of the zone maps, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to throw away, you know, substantial portions of data. It just means that there's some amount of data they were able to throw away. And in their world, that, that matters. Yes? This question is, if you have very large data, what's the overhead of pre-computing these zone maps? I mean, what's your idea of very large? Like petabytes? I have no idea. Uh, so most, like, most systems don't magically uh, conjure up petabytes of data instantaneously, right? It's, 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 a, it's usually a fire hose of something downstream in your application stack is generating data that you're now ingesting and storing. But it doesn't happen all at once. The only system I, can, I the only application I know where this does happen all at once is, was the, the, the Large Hadron Collider at, um, at CERN. Because when they did the experiment, like, poof, that thing generated petabytes you know, instantaneously, right? And they got to deal with that. Most systems are not smashing atoms, right? Most systems are like, okay, I'm collecting sensor data, or I have people using my website, 
and I'm, I'm getting things in, in, uh, in as, a, as a stream. So in that case, I can batch things up, compute these zone maps. Again, it's not expensive. I got to pack it into the, the file anyway, so I'm already reading it because I got to split things up into columns. It's, it's not expensive to maintain. So, um, right, so, so the alternative, so another approach we're going to look at is, uh, we're going to spend most of this class on is instead of using, so, so zone maps will help you sort of filter out blocks. But if you still want to find things that are actually matching, like you want an index, uh, for OLAP workloads, bitmap indexes are going to be the primary choice. Again, ignoring inverted indexes, ignoring uh, multi dimensional indexes, because those are sort of different type of queries. You know, think of things like you know, select star from table where attribute greater than something or attribute equal something. Right? Those, uh, you know, the, the, the full text indexes are trying to find you know, words in strings or, or text documents. We, we can ignore that for now. All right, so with bitmap indexes, the idea is that for every unique value in, in, a, in a column, in an attribute, we're going to maintain a separate vector with a bit set to 1, whether a tuple at that offset is, is, has that particular value. Um, so again, because everything's fixed length, we can just use the offset in the bitmap to then map to the offset in the actual da data columns themselves. So the i position in the bitmap cor corresponds to the i position in the tuple. And obviously, we're not going to want to have a giant bitmap for the entire table. We're going to do this as we chunk things up in, in like our PAX files or row groups, as we showed before. So bitmap indexes are an old idea. Uh, they go back to like the 1970s. Um, uh, and then there's this paper from 87 that sort of describes the first way to, uh, to put into actually a database system. And this is just a, a sample of, of some of the systems that support uh, bitmap indexes. Uh, Postgres has these things called BRIN. They're, they're going to be range indexes, range, bi, uh, binary range in, indexes, and that'll be, uh, we'll see range coding in a second. Pelosa is now commercialized as feature-based. This is nothing but a, a, a giant distributed bitmap index database. That's all it is. It's just bitmaps. Um, and then you can, uh, Pino has range indexes, uh, and a bunch of other systems that actually support this. Um, so, all right. Uh, so here's a really simple example. So we have a table that has two columns, the ID field, and then whether somebody's lit or not, um, yes or no. So say we want to build a bitmap index on this column. So we're going to have, since it's a, it's a binary value, uh, yes or no, we only have two bitmaps. And so we'll have one for yes and one for no. And again, there's a one in the bitmap corresponding to whether uh, the attribute within the original data has that particular value. Right? So if I'm looking inside this, if I jump to the fourth offset here, I can check to see that the, for the lit status is 0 for yes, it's 1 for no, so I know it's no. And that corresponds to the original value here. And this is like a bitmap index in its most basic form. It's pretty simple. Uh, and then we'll see some ways we can use SIMD to make this actually go faster so you're not actually just running in a for loop and, and examining bits one by one. Um, we'll cover it in a few more slides, and then we'll cover uh, l later in the semester a lot more. What kind of data is suitable for uh, bitmap index? Right. So this question is, which then leads to this next slide, what kind of data is suitable to be used in a bitmap index? Because right? if, if it's a, in the worst case scenario, again, thinking of extremes, if it's a auto increment key or serial key where every tuple has, has, an, has a unique value, that's the worst case scenario because I have a bitmap for every single one. Or every, every single value, and most of them are going to be all zeros. Or actually, every, every, every entry is going to be zero except for one. Um, and then my extreme case is, is like it's a, it's a binary decision, yes or no. That's the best case scenario. But most things are not that extreme. It's somewhere in the middle. Yes? Is it just like an enum value? Is like optimal for bitmap optimal? Her question is, or statement is, isn't it just an enum value? Yes. But okay, so yes, no is the enum, right? Uh, Uh, no, no, no. He doesn't have like multiple values. Like, no, no. He's correct that like this is like the, I'm just trying to show like there's two bitmaps. In a binary decision, it's either one or zero, so you only need one bitmap. Yeah. Right. So, so how about yes, no, maybe? You still you need three bitmaps. Like you're maybe lit, right? What? 
Yeah, see? Like your baby. So, so like, you, you need three bitmaps. Got it. But to your point, like. Uh, it's not really, I don't know if I'd call it a bitmap then. Because it's stored like, 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 like Yeah, so yeah. you're basically saying, that's it's basically enum as, it's stored as a column, right? Yeah. The, we'll see why you want to do this as we go along, right? Okay. Um, and you can have, again, you can have more compact form. I'm not even getting into like, Enum is maybe maybe also like it's a simplified example where like you could do the compression techniques and things like that. But let's we'll go along and, and we'll we'll see like because we store things in bits, we can play games uh, to make things run really fast. So this only works for the of our primary space. Yeah, so that's what I'm getting to. Not, nothing other than primary space. Thank you. Like you have the use. Right. So so his statement is this only works for category vari variables or values, which is the same thing as she's saying in enum, right? I will say, in, uh, uh, through our analysis of, of like schemas, most people don't. There's like enums are super rare. Right? So even though like it may be like in the application, treat, it really is an enum. They define it as an int or whatever, whatever, right? Without thinking about it. Um, to his comment also too that like it's a category of variable. Yes, but like, like it'll work on anything. Like you like I think like in Oracle or, or you can tell I want a bitmap index. It doesn't come back and say, hey, that's a bad idea. I'm not doing that, like, if it's, if it's the worst no, case scenario. I agree. It's only effective if, if it's on, I mean, restrictors that are valid. Yes, yes. Like, yeah, yeah, that, we're all saying the same thing. This, this is my example here to show, like, why this doesn't always work, right? So say I have a dimension table on the customer information, and then we have this, this zip code uh, attribute here, right? And so my query is select ID from uh, an email address from the customer dimension table where the zip code is in, in this range here or these, these three possible values in Pittsburgh. So I want to build an index on, on this column here. So if I build it as a bitmap index, uh, then it's going to be fast because you know, if I want to do a scan now to find all the matches for this, I just scan the, the three bitmaps that correspond to you know, 15216, 15217, 15218, and I just take the intersection of those, and now I know the tuples that, that matched. right? And I can do that evaluation of, of bits very, very efficiently, much, you know, much more faster than actually comparing two, two integers. Because right? I can take, you know, I can pack together a bunch of bits in a, in a you know, single value and then do the, the bitwise comparison on those. But of course, this obviously is going to be problematic, as, as you guys keep bringing up, because the value domain for zip codes in the United States is actually quite large. Let me take a guess how many zip codes there are in the US. 10,000. No, 100,000. 100,000. All right, it's, it's less than 100,000, more than 10,000. It's 43,000, roughly. So if I have 10 million tuples and I build the bitmap index on, on this, I have to have uh, 43,000 different bitmaps of length uh, you know, 10 million bits, and that's about 53 three gigs. Right? And the original data of just like 10 million 30-bit integers is like, what, 40 megs? So it's you know, we're paying a lot of a lot of space for all these bitmaps, and most of the time they're going to be they're going to be sparse. Most of the time it's going to be zero, right? So this sort of naive scheme of like, hey, let's just create giant bitmaps for the entire, uh, you know, for the entire length of all the tuples or all the size of the table, and have for every unique possible value that I have, right? This this is this obviously won't work. So we need to be smarter about how we're going to do this. So the two design choices we have to consider is the encoding scheme, so how to represent and organize the data within the bitmap. Uh, in my simple examples, I'm just saying it's a giant, uh, you know, you malloc a giant array of bits, but we, we can be more clever. Um, and then how do we actually compress the size or reduce the size of, of bitmaps where we know they're going to be sparse? So we'll cover this second one in the next class, and then this class we'll focus on the first one here. Okay. And so the idea again, we want to get, we don't want to, it's basically we're trying to, can we get the benefits that we would get if we had a bitmap uh, to do, you know, to accelerate scans without paying that huge storage overhead of, of these giant, you know, giant arrays of empty data. All right, so there'd be four encoding schemes we can consider. 
So the one I've already showed you is the quality coding, right? You just have a giant bitmap with a, for every unique value that you could possibly have in, in, in your column. Uh, with range encoding, uh, it's, it's a way to sort of store less bitmaps uh, for, for all the unique values. So instead of saying for, you know, for exactly 15217 and 15216 for those zip codes, what if I take a range of zip codes and then represent a bitmap of, of those values? And this is sort of what the, the, the column sketch paper you guys read. It's, it's building the basic same idea. Of course, now that means that uh, I could get false positives where I think I have a match. Uh, I could possibly have a match within some range. Um, I think I'm matching more tuples than I actually I am matching. Then I got to go check back the original values, the original base data, and, and do the final pruning. Um, so Postgres has this, with, again, with these, these, these BRIN indexes. Apache Pino uh, came out of I think it came out of LinkedIn. I forgot, uh, but that's a it's a open source uh, system, OLAP system that supports uh, makes heavy use of range indexes. Um, and again, the human has to specify these these ranges. As far as I know, that no database system can actually automatically figure these things out for you yet. Um, so hierarchical coding is a way to use a tree structure to identify the empty key ranges, uh, and then not not actually ever store them. So we'll see that in the next slide. And then bit slicing is a way to, to actually maintain a bitmap of a single bit location within a value, uh, within a column, and then do a bunch of tricks to speed things up uh, when you evaluate this. Bit slicing is a really neat idea from the 1990s. Uh, I don't think any system, maybe, I think Pinot might use something like this, or Pelosa. Um, but we'll see the modern variation of, of bit weaving from, from Wisconsin to how to, how to do this. Uh, do this very efficiently, which is pretty cool. OK, so let's go through the last two, because there's not much to say about range encoding. Obviously, again, it's just it's the same idea. Just you know, instead of having a bit up per value, you have one per range. All right, so higher encoding, the idea is going to be is that we're going to have a tree structure. We're going to organize the, the bitmap as a tree structure, where the, the, at each node, there's going to be a bitmap itself. Uh, like, and that's going to going to tell you whether the child represented by the position at that node is going to have a one below it in the subtree. So in this case here, so every node is going to have four bits. So every uh, or in its bitmap, internal bitmap, and then every node is going to have four children. So if I have a if I have a one in a position, then that's going to tell me that at the subtree uh, pointed down by by this pointer, there's going to be a one somewhere. I don't know where, but somewhere. So in this case here, the second position, it's 0. So I know that in, in the second child going down this subtree, there isn't going to be anything. So the way to think about this is along the, the leaf nodes, these are the offsets in the bitmap, just as we had before. And in, in this case here, I'm storing, uh, say, offsets at the top here, and I have the bits at the corresponding locations. Um, so I'm not actually storing the, the bunch of zeros. What you're really storing is just the the locations where you have a one, right? So to say, if I want to figure out whether uh, I have I have a, a bit set in position one, right? I start at the top. I say, well, I know I need to look at uh, this side of the tree. So therefore, the first bit is one. So I know, and, and not zero. So I need to go down here. This bit is uh, set to one. So I know I need to go down here. And then, lo and behold, I can look at my bitmap and see that there's there's something there, right? So what are some problems with this? So we should decide the size of the tree before. He says you need to decide the size of the tree before, the size of the nodes. Yeah. That's not hard, right? Because it depends on the number of uh, values I have. So I guess the distribution is the advantage of it. There will be one branch of that instead of just expanding and then where else? Of course, if, like it will be a really deep, like the height of, of the tree will be really deep. Uh, so his, his statement is that if if the, if the again so this is, so this is a bitmap this is the thing that says like was someone lit or not yes or no so this is just instead of storing it you know, as, as a giant array this this is the array so skewness in terms of what because because it's the bit set to one you know that corresponds to like this position here corresponds to one tuple. Right. 
it says that the distribution is uniform. Well, if all the bits are set to one, then yeah, you don't save any space. You actually you spend more spend more time. Yes. Yep, there you go, yes. And what else? Uh, it's tied, I mean, what's, what's reading the memory? The CPU, yeah. right? Yeah, so this seems like a great idea. Uh, and it's one of those things, again, this idea of like, it came out of the 1990s, it seems like a good idea, but nobody actually implements it because on a modern superscalar uh, CPU, this, this is, a, well, it came out of 2003, but um, on a modern CPU, this is a bad idea because now you have this, uh, this is indirection, whereas I'm doing this probing, I gotta go look at this bitmap, and I may go down one path versus another, and then that might be another cache line miss to go fetch this, right? So like, the 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 cost overhead, the, the, the storage savings you would get, is not worth the sort of the performance penalty you pay for using a, a probing data structure like this. Again, think of like trying to scan large things, because again, it's not not like a B plus tree where I can scan along the leaf nodes. I'd have to store some metadata, uh, either store some metadata about where, what position I'm in, uh, and then maintain pointers across to go from one, one node to the next, or I have to do a depth first search. I gotta, you know, traverse down here, and then come back up, right? And that's how I scan along get all the leaf nodes. And all that back and forth is, is very costly in a super scalar CPU where you don't wanna, you don't wanna have to uh, have stalls in your, in your extraction pipeline because now you're, you're jumping to another location. Yes? Uh, yeah, so statement is, uh, if, it's, again, it's, it's the enum category of value issue, right? If everything's one, then this. No, okay, not one. So basically, it's in this block, if one of the four values is one. Oh, yeah, yeah, so just, yeah, so like, yeah, so like in this case, if, if at least one value in, 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 a, in a node is one, then I have to maintain the tree structure. And so if these nodes are really big, I'm showing four, four bits per node, because I make it fit in PowerPoint. But like, if it's if it's something larger as it as it should be, uh, like a cache like a cache line size, like sixty four bytes, then the likelihood that something is going to be one, is is, is is yes, correct yes. All right, so, so he's basically saying again the just I got one bit set to true, and I got to store the, the entire node, and the nodes are going to be kind of large, right? Probably a cache line. So again, th this is. It seems cool, it seems clever. Uh, the savings is real. Or, uh, we go from eight bytes to four bytes. Um, but again, the, the, in a modern CPU architecture, this, this is gonna be, this is gonna be bad. And we're better off just by just scanning the data, ripping through it. Okay, so let me show you another variation uh, to do bit slicing, another way to encode things. So for this one, again, we're gonna have our original table. It's gonna have uh, this you know, ID, ID field, and then we're gonna have a zip code column. And these are actually all the zip codes of places I've lived before in my life. Uh, you know, I grew up in Maryland, in the Pittsburgh now, Compton, uh, Wisconsin, and so forth, right? So what we're gonna do now is we're going to flip around uh, how we're actually gonna be storing the, the data within the values themselves. So instead of having this bitmap to say, this bitmap corresponds to 15217. And there's a one if in, that, in that bitmap if the, if the tuple has that. We're now actually going to store the values themselves in, in bitmaps at a, at a sort of single rate, or single uh, in a bitwise manner. And then that's going to open up opportunities when we start doing predicate evaluation to do early pruning and identifying things that we don't need to actually need to read. So again, think of this as like you wouldn't want to store the table itself like this. This, this would be an auxiliary data structure, like an index, that we can then identify what offsets in the column of the original table are matching, and therefore we then need to go get the original, the, the, the full data on the columns, get the process rest of the query, right? So again, the way to think about bit slicing is that it's like when we took a row store and converted it to a column store, but now we're taking the bits that we're storing for each value and flipping that to be a column store, okay? And this is, this is an old idea. I think it comes back to, um, actually, I forget. I think, I think it's from, from the 90s. All right, so let's take the, the first value here, 21042, where I was born. So if we just convert that to its binary form, we end up with this bit string here. So again, I, I realize in a, in a, for a 
and I showed the, the table schema. It was a 32-bit integer. We're going to show 17 bits just to make it fit. So we're going to have 17 bits for the actual data itself. Then we'll have one uh, bitmap for to identify whether a value is null or not. So in this case here, the, 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 the value is not null, so that's set to 0. And then, we're, again, for every single bit along in, in the binary representation of the value, we're going to store it in, uh, in a bitmap like this. And the bitmap is going down, not across. So within a single position in the value of, 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 of the, the attribute, that, here's all the bits for that, for all the tuples. Right? So we can do the same thing for, for all the others. Right? So now, if our query comes along, find all the customers that are in a zip code less than 15217. What we can do is we can look at what is the first, uh, what is the, for this value here, what is the first position where in, 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 the, in the binary representation of the value, what is the first position of the, the, of the one? And we, therefore, we know that anything before that is going to be zero, and anything that, therefore, is not zero within those first positions, we can throw out entirely. Right? So I'm, going to, I'm basically going to walk through each slice and construct a bit, a result bitmap to say whether a, a, what tuple of different positions in, in each row matches. Right? So 15217 uh, is this value here. So the first three bits are zero, and then we have the one. So what we need to do is we need to examine, find all the, the entries here where the first three bits are, are not zero. And therefore, we know we can throw them out immediately. Right? And again, this is, we can go in, in using vectorized instructions. We can do this evaluation very quickly across these bits. And, and then we can sort of keep marching along, going down to the end. And at some point, we realize if there's, we reach the end and we're done, or there's, there's no matches, and we can stop early. Right? So this seems kind of, this is a way different way to think about how to evaluate tuples than like, hey, here's a for loop for every single tuple, apply, apply a predicate. Now we're looking at a batch of tuples all at once, but we're doing this you know, by bit by bit across all of them. So bit slices can be, again, are used for efficient aggregate computations. Like a really simple trick. If you want to do a summation on, on a column, you can use the Hamming weight, which is just the, or Hamming distance. It's the, it's the, it's the number of ones, or number, number of, uh, the, you count the number of non-zero bits, which is one, number of ones within a, a string of bits, right? So you walk along the slice and then count all the number of ones in the first slice, and then multiply it by 2 to the 17, right? Because that's their position in, uh, in integer form. And then you count all the ones in uh, the next slice, multiply 2 to 16, and you do this all of them go going across one by one. And you add those together, and you get the summation. And Intel added this pot count instruction, which basically gives you the Hamming weight. So you can do this with SIMD very, very efficiently. Again, instead of having to maintain an integer uh, sum and then having a for loop looking at every single tuple one by one, you go across these bit slices, do this simple math trick, and you end up with an aggregation very quickly. All right. So for, for aggregation, sure, this always works. The challenge, of course, is going back here. Uh, you know, for simplicity, I said, oh, yeah, skip any entry where the first three slices have a 1 in it. Uh, and I was sort of hand waving how quickly we found that out and then how, how, how we actually go from down the line. It's not that efficient uh, you know, if, if you have to look at all the bit slices. If you can throw everything out in the, in the first chunk or the first bit slice, fantastic. That's super fast. But for larger values, again, more than 17 bits, this is not, you know, this can get expensive. And again, you fall back to, can I just scan the data? That would be quicker. So any questions about bit slicing? Yes? So in a, in a modern CPU, like given how big a word is, like, you still have to have the full word written in the CPU register. And it's only written in the first few bits. So would you really save much? Because the majority of your cost in the database goes in terms of this guy over, right? And you still have to bring the whole word in to memory to recache. Right? So his, his statement is, um, uh, his, his statement is, how much is this actually going to save us? Because, well, you basically, at the end of the day, if you have to go get the disk, isn't disk always going to be the, the, the main bottleneck? Absolutely, yes. Um, this is sort of assuming once it's in memory, 
can you quickly rip through the, the, you know, the, the data that is in memory without having to go, you know, without having to go, go one, you know, tuple by tuple or, 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 or attribute by attribute, right? Um, or another way to think about this too, again, we're using this to do data pruning. So going back to that parquet diagram, they have the header has, the, has all this information. So if I just bring that in, then I can identify, oh, I don't need to read anything else because I have these bit slice indexes or filters, then I end up reading less data in total, and that's great. Right? And then you can play the trick of like, okay, well, doesn't it mean if I, if I check this index and then I do have to find something that I got to stall and go fetch why I get it? Well, if you, if you have multi-threading, you could bring one piece in, have one, you know, one, one thread chomp through this, while something else is waiting to bring the next piece in and staging that, right? And so you, there's always indexes to look at. If you then have to hand something off, say, okay, I do need to read rest of this data, right? You can, you can block that thread and run something else. Okay. So, um, so let's talk about bit weaving. So bit weaving is a modern uh, incarnation of, um, of bit slicing. And it's specifically designed for doing fast evaluation on compressed columnar data using SIMD. Is everyone here taking 618.14? Does everyone know what SIMD is? Who doesn't know what SIMD is? Awesome, fantastic. First, first time. All right, so, uh, right, so we'll ignore how we're doing diction order preserving dictionary encoding until next class. But basically what we're doing, again, we're trying to get bit level parallelization where we're trying to, uh, we're trying to, to, to scan lots of data, a lot, a, lot of a lot of tuples attributes at a bit by bit level uh, and be able to uh, identify quickly whether something's gonna match our predicate or not, right? So this idea first came from uh, University of Wisconsin and it was implemented in a uh, OLAP, uh, embedded OLAP engine called QuickStep. Think of like DuckDB before DuckDB, which is a thing called QuickStep, but it didn't have SQL, didn't have a parser, didn't have a query planner. It was like, it was like RocksDB, but for analytics, but, but without supporting SQL. Um, so they rolled this out of Wisconsin. It became an incubator project for Apache, but then in 2016, but then it, it got killed off in 2018. I forget what happened. Um, he went off, I think he did a startup. Uh, so this is invented by Jinex Patel. Uh, again, he's probably, along with the Germans, uh, Thomas Neumann in Germany, he's probably one of the best database systems researchers in the world. Um, uh, he's, he's really cutthroat, too. Like he, every time I show this picture, I always say, like, he would tell me stories about him growing up in India where he kept up, like, <laughs> getting on the bus just to go to school every day. It was really, but he's a super mild-mannered guy. It was, it was insane what he was telling me. Anyway, um, all right, so there's going to be two ways to do this. And again, this was in the, the, the uh, this was in the sketch paper you guys read. I think they, they allude to and talk about uh, bit weaving, but only the vertical approach. Uh, so we'll talk about both of them, um, and then you'll see why the vertical one is going gonna, is gonna to be superior. Oh, the other thing I also forgot to point out, too, is um, the, this paper came out in, in 2013. Uh, and so at the time, SIMD, at least on x86, didn't have scatter and gather operations. So they're going to be able to... to uh, do all the, the, get all the parallelism with vectorization, in some cases without SIMD entirely, but also if they are using SIMD, they don't require scatter and gather. Because um, again, now we have it, but back then they didn't. Um, you can, there are the modern versions that do it, take advantage of it, but it doesn't require it. And again, we'll cover scatter, gather, and SIMD stuff in more detail later in the semester. Right? So again, we're doing this, uh, we're gonna talk about the horizontal approach first, it's gonna be row-based, but again, think of it, it's, it's for a single column. So even though we're storing the bits within, the, within a value uh, in a row-oriented manner, it's assumed that it's on a single column, and the column will be stored as, as, as a, you know, in a columnar fashion. The attribute will be stored in a columnar fashion, right? It's again, it's, it's, think of it as a clever way to allow us to get better parallelism through, through vectorization because we're organizing bits. All right, so say we have our tuples here. Uh, and uh, this is just the binary form or whatever the storing. So here's the actual the numeric value that's being represented by all of these. So we're going to break it up into segments. Um, we're thinking of these, again, just like row groups as we had before. 
And for each segment, we're going to store the, uh, we would know how many values we need to store. And then we're going to represent them uh, in sort of this inter interweaved manner uh, where we will store in, uh, the contiguous memory will be, have gaps where we would come back around and get the, the next batch of tuples. So let me show what I mean by this. So think of this as like, this is the start of memory. And it goes here from here to here. So we're going to represent these three bit values in four bits. So you actually have the actual value, right? So the first one is 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 001 here. But there's always going to be a delimiter that's in front of it that's going to be a, a padding bit that's always set to 0. And we're going to, they're going to use this to then, uh, when you start doing the arithmetic to figure out whether something matches the predicate, they're going to use this to store whether the, the, the tuple matches or not in, in the output. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a second. And the other thing to point out also, too, is that the way it works is we go from top to bottom. So T, this is T0, T1, T2, T3. And then we loop back around and then append T4 to where T1 is. And same with T5 and so forth here. Right? And we'll do this when we start, because we need to get, convert out or extract out the matching tuples into a selection vector to know what offsets match. So if we organize it in this way, it'll pop out nicely. Uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean in a second. All right, so then the same thing for the second segment. We know there's two values, so we only have to store uh, two tuples, and there's dependent one after another. So again, I'm showing this with three-bit values with, with stored as four bits, and we'll just say this is a processor word, uh, which is eight bits. On x86, a processor word, I think, is 16 bits, because that's what it was back in the 80s. I think ARM is 32 bits. It doesn't matter. For simplicity, we're, we're using this, right? OK, so yeah, and then here, here's the delimiter that's always set to 0. So let's see how we might use these to match a predicate. We have a select star from table where value is, is less than 5. So we're just going to deal with just two tuples, like t1 and t4 that, that I showed before, going back, or t0 and t4. We're going to just deal with this first one here. Right? So the x is going to be the, 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 the actual tuple organized in the bit weaving uh, horizontal format. And then this, this y vector here. That's just going to be the, the constant that we're comparing, 5. right? And then there'll be this mass, just 0, a bunch of 1s. And we're going to use that when we do our, our, uh, when we do, do our arithmetic to figure out whether, this thing, whether the value is less than uh, the, the constant we're looking for. So the way it works is that we have this formula here. And we'll have a different formula per, based on what the predicate is. So this is for less than. right? You take the x score of the x and the mask add y to it, and then and it with a negation of the mask. And lo and behold, what you get as the output is a selection vector that tells you whether the, uh, whether the tuple actually matches. And so now you see in the padding here, that's where you, you put whether the, the predicate actually was satisfied or not. So you ignore the zeros. The padding here says 1 because t0 is what 1, and 1 is less than 5. So that matches. Uh, and then the, the, the second t4 is 6. And 5 is, is, is less than 6, so that, that's false. So that's set to 0. All right? So what's really cool about this is that it only requires three instructions to evaluate a single word. It works with any word size. As I said, these, these are 8-bit words. You can go larger. It doesn't matter. And all these different formulas here, they're all defined in the paper. They actually didn't invent these. Uh, actually, Leslie Lamport invented these back in the 1970s to do this kind of stuff, the, these bitwise comparisons. So again, Nothing I'm showing here is actually is actually SIMD. This is just doing you know this mask here. You can use regular SIST instructions, but you're still getting the the parallelism because you pack things in uh, to fit in a, in a single word, right? So this is pretty cool. Again, like 1970s SIMD, I think SIMD existed theoretically with uh, Flynn's taxonomy, but I don't think any CPU back in the 70s supported this. Like at least like, not not to the extent they do now, right? So again, I'm showing you 8-bit words. If you had 64-bit words, now you can pack in 16 3-byte values and do, again, do the simple arithmetic to compute the comparison very quickly. Yes? Why would they arrange vertically instead of horizontally? The question is, why would they arrange vertically instead of horizontally? Next slide. It'll, when we, we have to, at this point here, we just have a 1 and a 0 to say, yes, this match. We've got to convert this back into what is the offset of the tuple. And then it's raising horizontally will solve this problem. The statement is, does this mean you have one less bit to represent all your data? Yes, but. But like, so if you have normal, like, numeric int that's like, 32 bits, now it can't be put here because this will only give you 31 bits. 
Hey, David, is, if you had random 32-bit integers, uh, you know, wouldn't this actually wouldn't this actually not work? Uh, you'd have to get you'd have to know something about the value domain to say what's what's the minimum you can do, right? And this is why they're they're assuming they're dictionary encoded and order preserving. So so again, if these are a bunch of say the state codes in the United States, you could represent that in, in these bits. All right, so let me plow ahead and get through to answer her question. So yeah, these are all our our our, our, uh, our bit weaved packed. Um, I don't say pack, so that means that's a compression scheme. But these are bit we uh, bitmaps. So we can just do all the same comparison just that I showed in the last slide. And we have a bunch of vectors like this. Again, in our, in our delimiter, we have set 0 to 1 based on whether it matched. But now we need to convert this back into, again, whether what offset matched. So you just do simple bit shifting to slide things over based on where you are in the, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the list. And then now, when you when you you combine these together, then you end up with a bitmap that says what tuple actually matched. So that's why you have to shift. So this, this the t what t four was over here. When I shifted it over by one, when I push it up, it lands nicely where t four should be. Yes. Is the statement is isn't the one we saw before uh, more uh, I mean the higher encoding or. Oh, bit slicing. Is that more efficient? Yeah, because in this, when you fetch it, we're, we're fetching not just the data, but the bit file as well. So we're fetching the word and the bit to do any operation. Whereas in that case, we only have to fetch the bit. So the storage, of, the storage of the bit slicing approach is potentially more efficient. I mean, because our bottleneck is always a bit file, right? Yes. Uh, yes, but this this bit's not a. No, not the bit. Because we're going to fetch the data as well. So even if the data is like thirty-two bits long, and it doesn't matter if you have another bit, you're fetching the thirty-two bits of the data as well. Whereas in bit slicing, you're only fetching one bit for every thirty-two bits. Yeah, I understand. Um, I I had to look at the original paper. I forget whether it, I think it might have compared against bit slicing, and this is this is way faster. This is faster, yes. Uh, actually, the, the vertical one we'll see next. That's actually even faster. Yeah. All right, so that answered your question. Like why they, you shift it over and you pop it up, and then that, that's why they, they, do, they arrange it that way. All right, so this is called the selection vector. Right? This basically is a bitmap that says, did, did our, did our, does the value for the, the does the, the tuple of this offset, did this match our predicate or not? But again, it's just a bitmap. We've got to convert that back actually to numerical offsets. Right? So, there's two ways to do this. One is, the, is to do a real simple thing, would just be take our selection vector and just write a for loop and say, well, if the bit's set to one, then I know this is the tuple at this offset that I, that I need to consider. It'll work, but it's slow. Um, so the better approach is to do a pre-computed positions table, where you recognize, oh, the size of my bitmap isn't that big. In this case here, it's, it's, it's eight bits. So that means that there's only two to the eight different possible combinations of, of offsets that could be in this bit represented by this bitmap. So I can just pre-compute that. There's a giant array where the offset of the integer off, or the integer representation of the bits corresponds to an offset position table, and then I have a pre-computed vector of the tuples that match. All right, so this is 150. I jump to one position 150, and there's there's there, there's my offsets. And I can keep that, that this this positions table. Uh, it's 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 in the low megs. So uh, if that, I can keep this in L L two or L one. Um, so this is a technique was invented by Vectorwise um, in the late two thousands, and then we end up using this in our in our own system for our own research on uh, vectorized execution stuff. But pap papers will cover a later semester, right? All right. So this is the horizontal. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. But that's already in the register, right? There's no cache. But I, I, I got to go examine the bits. There, is, there isn't an instruction that says, convert these bits into the integers. So you just pre-compute this little small table, and this is way faster. Right? 
All right. Okay. So this is the horizontal representation. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether they actually implemented this in Quick Step. No other system I know actually does this. I just find this like super cool and super clever, like th things you can do. The vertical one is the one that showed up in the, in the sketch paper you guys read. So same thing as before, we're going to split our tuples up into segments or row groups. Uh, but now what we're going to do is going to we're going to generate bit slices for uh, all the positions and store those continuously in memory. Right. So take all on the first column, all the second column, and the third column, and each segment will store those uh, those bits. Right. And in this case here, even though the, the, the second segment only has two tuples, we have to store the entire uh, bitmap with, with just a bunch of useless data because we have to make sure that everything fits in, uh, in our process of words. Right? All right, so what can you do with this? Well, uh, when we want to start doing evaluating tuples, we can use now SIMD to, to compare tuples, or sorry, compare bits uh, on a bit by bit basis within the value that we're looking for and write along in, in CMD registers without having to go back to, to regular CPU registers and compute the, our predicates very efficiently. So say we have now select star from table with value equals two. I'm showing with the inequality predicate just for simplicity, but you, you can use inequalities as well. So for this one, we're going to represent it in binary form, 0, 1, 0. And we want to do an evaluation of the first bit and find all the matches within our uh, first, first bitmap vector. In our, instance in our first slice. So we, we throw out this, this empty zero mass thing. We do our SIMD compare to see whether it's true. And then we get, we get back, uh, we get better, you know, a selection vector like this, right? Then we have to then evaluate the second one. But we only want to compare the, uh, the ones where we know that, that actually match the first one. So it would be these positions here. So we bring in another mask to do that comparison. And then this would then produce out a, uh, in this case here, all zeros. So we just used that pop count thing before when we looked at the vector and say, how many ones are there? As soon as we get the vector comes out with, with all zeros, we know, we know we're done and we do early pruning. All right, so this is, this is basically bit slicing, but a way to do, do it with, with SIMD efficiently. All right? In the case of uh, in the horizontal encoding, we can't do early pruning because we have to always look at the, 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 whole, the whole tuples, the whole, whole bits within the attribute or the value. In this case here, because we slice it up, we can do uh, early stops. Uh, it's, it's just showing you how to do it with, with SIMD. I mean, to do bit slicing on SIMD, we're doing the same, exact same operation as bit slicing. Yes, but like the visual bit slicing paper doesn't say how to do this. That's, that's the difference, because it was from the 90s. All right. Uh, right. So in this case here, we're able, we're able to examine uh, eight tuples uh, with two instructions. That's insane. It's amazing. Um, again, if you had to do a you know, sequential scan with a for loop and evaluate tuples one by one, and their attributes in a column, you're not going to get down to in two instructions. It's not entirely, I mean, it's two SIMD instructions, but there's instructions to get things in and out of the registers. You pay that cost, but we're ignoring that for now. All right? All right, that's a lot. So what, where have we gone so far? We've done zone maps, bitmap indexes, bit slicing, bit weaving, and then we'll finish up quickly and talk about column imprints and column sketches, OK? All right, so all the bitmap schemes I showed you so far uh, are about storing exact representations of the data within the columns. Meaning, again, think of the, the simplest case of the bitmap, uh, the, the basic bitmap index with the quality uh, encoding. There's a one whether in a bitmap whether the value is equivalent or not. Uh, now, the range encoding, you're kind of grouping things together. And as I said, that's what basically sketching is trying to do, but in a different way. Uh, but in general, like it's if ignoring range encoding, if I could check a bitmap, and it says something matches, I know it matches. And I don't have to go double check on the, on the actual tuple to make sure I don't have false positives. All right? But in some cases, if we give up some of this accuracy uh, to, to support faster evaluation and maybe more compact uh, bitmaps, uh, then that actually might be a big win for the common case. 
again, there's extreme examples as we talked about. Those may not work perfectly for this, but most data doesn't look like that. Right? Most data is highly skewed. And of course, again, we may have to check original data in some cases to make sure there's no false positives. In the case of the range encoding uh, example, I always had to go check. But in the sketch check, in some cases, I know I, there'll be some times where I don't have to check. So Kalman prints is a precursor to, uh, to, uh, to the column sketches. And the basic idea is that we're going to have a bitmap that says whether something could exist. It's basically collapsing down the, the bit slices into a single bitmap instead of multiple slices. So say my original data is 184. Uh, so if I had bitmap indexes like this, you, know, it, you would see that like, you know, for the different poss possible values that I have, there's a bunch of ones that there's a bunch of columns or a bunch of bitmaps that are zeros. So instead, if I distort an imprint, if I just collapse this all down by uh, ordering everything, uh, then I end up with a single bitmap called called an imprint, and I can use that to then determine whether quickly whether something exists or not. And again, if if I get a one here or a one over here, I got to go check the original value, uh, the original tuple to see whether it's actually a match or not. But if I'm landing in maybe in here, I know there's a zero. So I don't have to do anything. What's that? It's like a bloom. Filter. It's like a bloom. Yeah, it's, same, it's like a bloom filter, um, without without sort of a yeah without I guess a uh, like any sort of false positive rate guarantees or things like that. Um, we'll cover bloom filters in much more detail when we talk about hash joins, but basically same idea. Yes. You good. Yeah. All right. So this was done, and this was done in ModeDB uh, again in the early 2010s. So the column sketch paper you guys read was is a variation, as I said, of bitmap range encoded bitmaps, where the idea is that we want to maintain a, a sketch, which is uh, is like a probabilistic data structure, kind of like a bloom filter. Where there's, there's count many sketches and things like that, but it's an approximation of what data exists, um, and it's it's going to be the bit will be set to true to determine that there is something, uh, there could be something in this range. So the idea is that we want to convert our, uh, our sort of base values into these smaller codes, and then we would use those codes to figure out how much data we actually have to look at. All right, so of course now there's going to be a trade-off between the distribution of the values and the compactness. Right? If our codes are the same size as the original data, then they're going to be very precise. But of course, that means that we're not going to be able to throw a lot of, you know, throw anything away, uh, and, and, and waste space by maintaining the, basically the values twice. Uh, they will have a special case for the, the most frequent values to avoid false positives, because otherwise, if something appears all the time, uh, and they get sort of grouped together, you may have to go always oh, check to see whether the thing actually exists or not. Um, but if you have a special case, I know this this frequent value appears most, you know, 99% of the time. Here's the exact value for it. I can just go do that lookup and avoid having to, to go read things I don't need. All right, so here's a high-level overview of how it works. So say we have our original data, and we're storing this as 8-bit values. So what they're going to do is basically take a pass over the data. Again, we can do this if, if, it's, if we're, we're creating an immutable file, and we've got to read everything in and, and encode it and write it out. So they can build a histogram where they want the, the height of the data represented within a range of the histogram, within a bucket, to be equivalent. You know, so you want you want the uh, you don't want to you don't have one range have a lot of skew, and therefore it's, it's it's you're doing a bunch of lookups on it for useless data. And so then, based on this histogram, again the, the paper sort of describes how you'd actually want to build it. Uh, you maintain this compression map. The idea is that you would say within this, the, the values over here, it's less than a greater, less than or equal to this, you get mapped to some smaller, some smaller dictionary code here. And then now, when you want, 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 want to represent this column as a, in the sketch form, you're going to store these these uh, these codes here instead of the actual original values. So say the original values were, were eight bits, I can store it now down into to two bits. So now when a query comes along, like select star from table where value is less than 90, I do a lookup in my map and figure out what's the, the, 
what's the highest, the, the smallest value that will be covered by the thing I'm looking for. In this case here, 90 is greater than 60, so I, I got to go to the next one. 132 is greater than 90, so I, I can stop here. But I know I need to consider the, the values that are encoded by, uh, by, by the, these code values here. Right, so you, you basically convert, you would use the mapping function to convert 90 into 0, 1. And then I go do a lookup in my, uh, I, I know these are the offsets that are matching for me in, in, my, in, my, in my sketch column. But because 132, 132 is greater than 90, we don't know whether there might be a value like, like 91, 92 that doesn't satisfy our predicate, but is still uh, within the scope that it, that's managed by this code value here. So for 0, 1s, we have to go back to the original data and see whether the, you know, the, 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 we have a false positive or not. So in this case here, both 0, 1 point to uh, the, the code 0, 01 points to 81 and 140. 81 would satisfy our predicate. 140 does not. Isn't there a technical error here? Because 132 means that like 0, 01 is in the range of 60 to 132, right? And so 0, 01 can't map to 140. 140 should map to 10, isn't it? Uh, that's a typo, yeah. That's my fault. Did I screw this up? Yeah, I, I probably might have typed that wrong. That's my fault. Yeah, so I'd say this is uh, 120. Yeah, 120. Yeah, that's a typo. Yes? Um, so, doesn't this suffer from the same problem as we discussed earlier about indirection that we have to go out of memory? So, the statement is doesn't this have the same problem as before where, well, so indirection in terms of like traversing the, the data structure itself or actually doing this like second lookup over here? Second lookup. Uh, like, so, you had one. Yeah, so his, his statement is, when I talked about the hierarchical encoding, I talked about how like, I got to go up and down the tree to go, go find all the bits. That was just trying to find the matches for the bits, like where they were set to one. Then I go look out and get the actual tuples themselves in the table. In this case here, I can scan through this column quickly, find all the positions where it's either 0, 0, or 0, 1. Then for the ones that are uh, 0, 1, again, it depends on what the, the, the query actually needs. I then do my batch lookup to go get the actual, look at the, examine the actual the data itself. Right? So you would scan this thing first, get all the offsets. Uh, you could use a pre computed table if you wanted to. It doesn't matter. Get all the offsets where, this, 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 it's that, that, where it satisfies my code, where it's less than or equal to 0, 1. I got to go get, maybe get the data anyway, because in this case here, it's select star. So I got to go get the, all the values anyway. Then I just do an extra check there before I, I shove up to the next operator in the query plan. Okay, other than the type of the Abby picked, picked out, thank you. Uh, any questions about this? Yes? Isn't the main optimization that if it isn't on that boundary, like the 0, 1, if it's 0, 0, you don't have to do the second. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. So his statement is one of the optimizations you, you would get is. Uh, I only have to check for 0, 1 to avoid false positives. In the case of 0, 0, I don't have to go check. And again, like, it depends on what the query, plan, query is. If it's a count, then I go check these, but I count it all together. If I need to do like a join where I do need maybe the column, I got to go fetch it anyway. But I don't have to do the comparison because I know it, it satisfies my predicate. All right, cool. And on time. All right, so, uh, so zone maps, as I said, are the most widely used uh, method to accelerate sequential scans. It's pretty much what uh, everyone will give you. I think Parquet, and, actually, I know about ORC. I know th this is what Parquet, the only thing Parquet has. Um, bitmap indexes are more common in the uh, sort of the enterprise row stores. I don't want to say Postgres lists themselves enterprise, but I mean like the Oracles and, and SQL servers, like things that cost a lot of money. Because um, they, again, they're trying to get the benefits of of sort of columnar processing on data without having to, you know, to have a whole column store engine, which they, they all eventually built anyway. And as I said, we're completely ignoring multidimensional indexes and inverted indexes. Uh, I don't think they teach 826 anymore, but that whole class was about th this kind of stuff, KD trees, R trees, and so forth. 
we can ignore that. Geospatial things, we ignore that. And then Inverta index uh, is just like a mapping from a word or an n-gram within a text field to the actual tuples that match. Okay? All right, so next class, we'll talk about data compression. We'll spend most of the time talking about tuples, but we'll also talk about how we actually can compress these, uh, these bitmaps as well, beyond the things we talked about before. Okay? All right, so quickly, I want to talk about project one, uh, which is out. Thank you for WAN for updating uh, everyone at Piazza. Um, so for the first project, the, you guys will be writing a foreign data wrapper for, for Postgres to access, um, to access d uh, columnar data stored in a file format that, that we invented. Um, the reason why we didn't choose Parquet or ORC because there's existing libraries to, to, uh, to access them, and they basically take care of all the complexity for you. Um, and it's way more complicated also bring it in those, those other libraries. So we, we just gave you something really simple and he implemented that. So a foreign data wrapper is basically a way to have, or if you're familiar with SQLite, it's called a virtual table. It's a way to basically, or sometimes it's called a connector, but it's basically, it's a, it's a way to have link in a shared object to Postgres that allows you to override uh, scan operators on a table to go to whatever the, the, that shared object wants to support rather than always going to their, their you know, internal base tables. So there, there's, there's foreign data wrappers to read CSV files. There's foreign data wrappers to read, uh, you know, maybe connect to another database system, right? Postgres is actually really extensible. It's, it's, it's very amazing. It's an amazing, it's an amazing data system, but it's also very extensible, which is pretty cool. Um, so there's, there's, there's actually commercial products that build foreign data wrappers for, for Postgres, like Timescale is, makes heavy, heavy use of this. But again, from the, from, the, from the SQL perspective, it looks like a regular table, even though it's gonna go through your code, right? And the goal of this is get, get, get you familiar with how to extend Postgres, because you could use that for project three, uh, but also to actually implement the things that we're talking about in class today, or in the last couple of classes, of how you had to scan through columnar data. So the file format that, that WAN developed, it's pretty basic, we're not doing any compression, it's just storing things in columnar data, in columnar format. And the header has JSON, oh, sorry, the footer has JSON metadata about where to find the offsets for, for different types of data. So I bumped the deadline up. I don't know, I think it was due the 16th or something. Now it's due the 26th, which is a Sunday. And all the, the information is on the, the project website now. And then I'll post on Piazza um, a spreadsheet. Actually, no, so I already know, I already know everyone's Android ID. I will, uh, I'm gonna fill out a form to get uh, E AWS credits. So then I'll send everyone an email if you're enrolled in the class, uh, the code for like a hundred bucks from, from Amazon. You can use that for development if you want. Uh, you can use it for Bitcoin mining if you want. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I don't care. Um, so anyway, like you can make it work on your laptop, make it work on EC2, but it, at the end of the day it has to compile and work on uh, AWS, or sorry, on, on Gradescope. This is how you submit this. So again, we've already provided you a basic file format. Uh, and there's, there's instructions on what, what, what it actually looks like. It's not, it's not super sophisticated. It's not doing any compression. It's, it's literally just storing data in binary form in, in, columnar, in a columnar arrangement. So the first step you want to do is just write a uh, parse over this file just to scan individual columns and try to stitch tuples back together. And when you process, when you, when you read the metadata, understand what the offsets are, and know how to put, you know, put tuples back together. And then you want to integrate this um, in Postgres, again, using the foreign wrap data wrapper API, uh, I think when we provide them some basic skeleton code already, right? Yep. So there's some basic skeleton code, some functions you gotta fill out, and there's instructions on the website of how to actually compile it and then link it in, in, into Postgres, right? And then the, the, the last step is then you wanna actually support predicate evaluation. So you can have Postgres take the where clause. We're not trying to support all, everything you could possibly do in a where clause. Some basic uh, comparison operators That'll get passed to you in what are the Postgres struct, and you want to then apply the, the predicate on the data in your, as you scan the data. Okay? You want to build the joins, right? What's that? Joins are you, you don't have to do joins. Yes. It's, just, it's, hard enough, it's it was surprisingly difficult enough just to do the, 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 the scan as a foreign data wrapper. So, I suppose I say, Postgres is extensible. That's great. I never said it was easy to extend. You can extend it, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so, right, so the, the way to get started, as I said, start with the, the, just writing the parser code without any Postgres. You can just do that, in, you know, do that locally. Um, you should do this in C++, and we're giving you, uh, you know, skeleton code that uses PGXS. 
if you want to do Rust, talk to Chi. Uh, he's going to tell you to go away, but like, you looked into it, right? Or Wan looked at it. We don't, we don't think it. You don't think you can do it. But it, you, well, he, he, he can do it because, <laughs> because he's on <laughs> uh, I'll believe that out. All right, so, and just like the intro class, make sure you, uh, you know, make sure you do all your debugging locally. Um, you know, and you write your own local tests. Don't use Grayscope to do this, okay? Because it's going to be slow. All right, so don't change any of the files that we don't, for, other than the ones that you submit to, to, to on, on Gradescope, because those will get wiped when we compile it and link it in on, on Gradescope. Make sure you, you fork our version of Postgres, because it already has the, the scaffolding code that Win has set up. And it's all sort of set up for you to like, you know, compile from the command line or VS code, or whatever, whatever C line he's using. All that's in there, and then you'll be able to link it in. You don't have to figure that out yourself, which is not trivial. And then please post questions on Piazza or come to the TS office hours. OK? So there are example farm data wrappers that, that are in the write-up uh, that WAN has linked to. Um, there's the, the Parquet one, and then there's the Citus one. Uh, you know, some of the scaffolding code will, will look very similar. Uh, it won't be entirely useful to you, but you can at least look at it as a reference, but avoid copying wholesale without attribution from, from the existing code you may find. Okay? And also, too, because there's always random people on the internet that see the videos and try to implement themselves. Avoid their stuff, OK? It's usually crap. I'm not going to lie. Um, OK, all right. Any questions? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes. It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case on the bar. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say fruit makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>